Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jim Ballou. I'm a principal solutions architect with BlackBot, uh, and I am going to be your session host today. Welcome to Practical Customizations in BlackBot CRM. As always, we have to present a safe harbor statement. Um, we are going to be talking about things that are forward looking. Things can change. Um, this is the standard boilerplate legally saying that we expect that the things that we present today are accurate and uh, <laughs> useful. Um, but things can happen, and so time frames and things like that might change as well. Also, in this session, we may be providing guidance on how to make customizations to your BlackBot solutions. Um, support for customizations is retained by you, the customer. So please see your BlackBot scope of customer support for details. And with that, I'll welcome David. We are ready for you to kick off. Hi everyone, I'm David Stepp. I'm the Director of Technology with uh, Providence St. Joseph Health. Um, I'm gonna just be brief and give sort of a higher level overview as to why we do the customizations, but then I'm gonna turn it over pretty quickly to, to Carrie and Dan to uh, to present the, uh, the real reasons that you're here, not to listen to me. Um, this is us. Uh, we are Providence St. Joseph Health. Um, been on CRM for um a couple of years we've we've gone through a series of rolling go lives you can see that we've we've merged 30 separate databases into crm that represents about 39 maybe 40 by now um uh foundations um uh brandon winchester in an earlier session mentioned that blackboard crm customers are a varied and complex group um providence is a varied and complex group just within providence you have large hospitals large market hospitals rural hospitals um uh, research foundations, hospices, um, and soon to add a, a high school and university into uh, into the CRM mix as well. Um, so I want to talk a little about why we do customizations, um, and then uh, and then and then a little about how about how we uh, we manage uh, the workload, um, usability and efficiency. This is this is um, this is the reason everybody does this. Uh, so I'll, I'll skip past that one, but at Providence, because of the um, complexity and the and the number of organizations that we that we support, um, we have a great great need for standardization and consistency. Uh, the large hospital or large foundations with with twenty development officers and a plan giving program, et cetera, um, have have a lot of different needs or greater needs uh, with regard to to metricing their staff and, and reporting on various things than than say a small hospice that might have two fundraisers. Um, so we're trying to build in uh, both flexibility and standardization into the into the product uh, when we when we do these customizations. Um, working on that in a few different ways uh, we're trying to create a data pr presentation layer both within the product and you'll see an example of that or two. Um, and then we're also uh, building out in Power BI uh, a reporting tool and and that, that could apply to this could apply to any reporting tool, but we're just we just happen to be using Power BI at the moment. Um, we want that data to be uh, self-serve. And by self-serve, we that means um, both the uh, or all of the report writers that might be on my team. Uh, it might be report writers at a local foundation or a regional level or at the system wide level. Uh, and it could be end users as well. Um, we do uh, work pretty hard to present uh, raw data, calculated data, compiled data, but underneath it all is a um, is our our criteria that are that are that are standardized across across the system. So rather than rather than an end user um, relying on themselves or each other to to build an ad hoc query that might have varying uh, criteria week to week, month to month. Um, we're building that criteria into into the presentation of that data so that when one foundation pulls their fundraising total and then somebody else does it, they're going to get the same number and they're going to count things in the same way. Um, I've already talked a bit about the uh, about the site structure, those 39 foundations, so I'm not going to not going to dwell on it here, um, but just want to reemphasize um, trying to standardize all of the actual reporting, but maintaining flexibility within the system so that a large hospital versus a hospice versus a university can um, can can use the product in the way they see fit. 
a um, couple more items in uh, in working through um, how we were going to approach this uh, I, and this just comes from from years of experience I, I guess working uh, within blackbot CRM or just working in the nonprofit world um, we wanted to protect our developers so we set set up a couple of um, uh, very specific development positions these guys do development work they occasionally get into training in the help desk but for the most part they spend all of their time um, uh, developing in the product we do have a dedicated um, trainer and a dedicated help desk and, and a team that supports that those two functions so that we take the weight of uh, of that sort of function off of our off of our developers um, many of you may work for an organization where your developer is also your report writer is also the person that pulls mailing lists and event invitation lists um, we try to keep those things separate um, and and keep our developers uh, sort of protected that way we do um, uh, have a fairly typical kanban board azure devops um, we measure uh, our different uh, customizations or, or our different projects by their business value, by their by the level of effort. Um, but we also try to sneak in the quick wins in order to build trust and adoption within our users. And we do uh, what we think of as weekly sprints. They're not necessarily formal sprints the way uh, you might think in a uh, in a much larger development shop because we are small and agile. Um, um, so with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Carrie Mayetta uh, to get started, and um, and we'll see some of these uh, practical customizations. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Carrie Mayetta. I'm one of the grateful to be protected developers at Providence. We're trying to squeeze a lot into the session, so if you want more info about me, please check out my speaker bio. The first thing we're going to look at is a customization created to add revenue recognition credits. Here's the business problem we were addressing. In a nutshell, it takes a long time to individually add recognition credits. Let's take a quick look at an example of this. Here is a revenue transaction page for a gift from my test constituent, Zoe Zambrano. We recently added Zoe's spouse, Zach, to CRM and added a recognition credit default for him. But since it was created after this gift was added to CRM, the gift is missing the recognition credits for Zach. The gift is only credited to Zoe. To add a recognition credit, we need to go to the revenue application page, click on the recognition tab, edit recognition credits, search for Zach's constituent record, and then fill in the rest of the data on that row, click save, and then you will see that the recognition credit indeed is added to that application. In addition, if we go back to the revenue transaction page, the recognition credit is showing up on the first revenue application. We would need to do the same process in the second revenue application to complete the processing for this one donation. Now multiply that by the number of transactions you need to credit, and you can see how this can take a lot of time. So here are the high level requirements. We wanted to make this a en masse type of process and allow our users to specify the source and recipient constituents, the gifts to credit based on gift date, transaction type, and site. Users should be able to specify the recognition type and the match factor. And only a single user can add recognition credits at a time for a given recognition default. Initially, I looked at using something like the steps edit form uh, in, in a collection there to hold the revenue. But I quickly determined that this collection would be great for small result sets of revenue, but it would be difficult for the user to use with larger data sets and for grouping of revenue by commitments and transactions. So what do we come up instead? Here's my test constituent Zoe. We decided to utilize the recognition credit default because it allows us to encapsulate the source and recipient constituents in a single ID. And it speeds up entry since the match percent and recognition credit type are already entered by the user. We added a, an action here to launch it. And here it is. The context record ID is the ID from the recognition default. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, we include some basic information from the 
recognition default in the summary view and a little bit very rudimentary steps instructions there as well. And we have a link to our knowledge base article at the bottom. Here we populate a data list with all revenue given by Zoe that's not credited to Zach. This is based off of the out of the box um, revenue history data list. You can group by transaction or commitment, filter by type, dates, and site. You can see this first transaction is actually the one that was in the, the slides before. Um, it's only showing the application that remains to be credited. This was not credited. So you can see there's only 50 of 100. Let's select that one. And now it's moved over to the right side. What's happening here is we're putting this into a table um, with the app user ID, the default recognition credit ID, and the revenue split ID. And that table is used as a source for the data list on the right and exclusion from the data list on the left. You can also see that now the, the button is um, enabled and we can change this if we want to or not. This is defaulted to what was on the recognition default. And we can click add and off it goes. This is the transaction page for what we saw. And you could see that this is uh, the credit that was missing. And if we hit refresh, ta-da, at 75%. There it is. The other thing to note here is that we're using the multi-select ability of uh, data list. So you can shift select or, you know, multiple select here um, to add revenue over. There are some issues with that though. So we've also added this select all revenue um, action here that selects everything. I would have asked for hands, a show of hands of who knows uh, what the issues are, but in lieu of time, we will just go through them. So if you look here, I'll check all but it says I selected 30, but there's a lot more than 30 here. If we go to page two, you can see that nothing's checked. And if we go back to page one, all my checked revenue is gone. In addition, if you're using a, um, what is this called? This is a, uh, I forgot. Oh, relational grid view um, here for this data list. The checkbox is not even visible. It's not even there. But we still chose to use this because um, it's still useful. In fact, it's very useful for commitments. Uh, if you look here, this is a pledge and all of the pledge payments applying to that pledge. So all I have to do is click on the pledge and it selects all the payments as well. And then I can move those over and then credit those. One last thing to demo here is in this tab, I'm running a session running as David, and he's in this exact same constituent, exact same recognition default, and he will go and uh, click add to get to the page, and he gets a message saying that I have this locked, um, and only one user can do this at a time. You might re remember that this was one of our requirements, and we'll take a look at how that's done in a bit. How is this page constructed? We have set the hide explorer bar page property to true to give us more real estate. The summary section is a UI model view data form, which allows us to display this normal view or the lock error message. There is a single tab with the layout mode equal to two columns. Here's column one, here's column two. In column one, we have a blank view data form in order to make the select all revenue action more visible. To implement this, we are writing the data list results to a table and both this action and that data list pull from that table. And of course, we have got the data list here. In column two, we have a custom UI model form. I like using these to speed up data entry because the user can enter directly into the form without needing to open or add, um, open an add or edit form. This is the data list that shows all the selected revenue. And at the bottom, 
we have a link to our knowledge base article. It's included in a page action group, and the items of note here are that we're using BlackBot's open web page action JavaScript to open the new tab populated with our knowledge base article, and we're using the render location to put it at the bottom of the page instead of on the default location on the explorer bar on the left. So let's go back and take a deeper dive into the uh, record locking and how we implemented that. We implemented this as a semi-optimistic record locking scheme because one, we anticipated a very low collision rate and two, for simplicity. We didn't want to lock the record as soon as a user landed on the page and we were concerned about users opening the page and then leaving. We didn't want to deal with releasing the locks in those cases and or needing to deal with lock expirations. I say it's semi-optimistic because at the point we attempt to acquire a lock is when the revenue is selected. When either of these actions are clicked, but before we move the revenue applications to the data list on the right, not when the recognition credit is being added by clicking on the big orange button. If the lock acquisition is successful, the revenue is moved to the selected data list. Even though we don't acquire the lock at page load, we do check to see if the record is already locked by the user. This accomplishes two things. One, the user is aware of the lock before proceeding. And two, we can use a page refresh to display the lock error message. In fact, we do a page refresh on every state change to refresh both data lists and to display the lock message if needed. In the previous example, if we go back there, when we click the buttons, if the lock acquisition was unsuccessful, we merely do a page refresh and the error is displayed. This is a snippet from the spec for the lock table. And you can see here that we're storing the revenue recognition default ID and the app user ID who acquired the lock. The key to this, pun kind of intended, is a unique index on the recognition default ID. Hello? So how does this work? I'm sorry? Oh, okay, how does this work? Um, this is our sprock to acquire a lock. Let's add a watch to our lock table here. It starts out empty. And then I call the sprock to acquire a lock. I pass it Zoe's recognition default to Zach and my user ID. We check to see if a row exists in the table with that recognition default ID and my app user ID. It doesn't exist, so we go to the else block where we attempt to insert a row into the lock table with the recognition default ID and my app user ID. The insert succeeds, therefore the lock is acquired and we set lock acquired to one. Now let's call the same sprock this time with the exact same recognition default, but with David's app user ID. Here we check to see if the row exists in the table with Zoe's recognition default ID and David's app user ID. It doesn't exist, so we go to the else block. However, this time the insert statement raises an error because the is unique index constraint is violated. This the row exists already in the table with the same recognition default ID that we are attempting to insert. So the lock cannot be acquired and we set lock acquired to zero. This is the beauty of allowing SQL Server to manage the lock acquisition. It doesn't matter how many people simultaneously attempt to acquire the lock, SQL Server will only allow one person to successfully insert the row and everyone else fails. So you might be asking, why are we even doing this check every time we checked it so far, it hasn't evaluated to true yet. Let's call the sprock again um, as me with that same recognition default. Let's say I refreshed the page or added more records to select as selected. When we come to the check, we check to see if a row exists in the table with that recognition default ID and with my app user ID. It does exist, and so we go to the the then block, um, and we set lock acquired to one. The reason we do this is to avoid attempting an insert because that would fail. So how do we do? Here are a couple of comments we received. 
I love this function. I think I use it multiple times daily. Updating recognition credit had always been a bit of a chore when connecting spouses with existing constituent records, but now it is so simple. I really can't express how much I appreciate this function. Each time I use it, I think of how much time I'd be spending on updating recognition without it. Okay, that was quick. <laughs> now I'd like to share a quick and dirty catalog browser enhancement that I created. I wanted to be able to search for any spec loaded in the database for any environment, hosted or not. Um, the out-of-the-box catalog browser only displays the specs that are embedded in the assemblies found in vroot bin or vroot bin custom, uh, which are just a fraction of all the specs loaded in the DB. I also wanted to be able to view and download any spec returned by my search, and I wanted to be able to unload a spec in any environment, hosted or not. So I created a data list, and you're able to filter by the name, the description, the ID, of the spec in the catalog table, the different spec types, and by author. So I can search, and I'll find a test spec that I have. I am using the exact same form from the out-of-the-box catalog browser uh, to view the XML and to be able to download it. And I'm also creating an action to unload the spec. So if we take a look at uh, this assembly here, you can see that it's loaded. And of course it's loaded because it's here. <laughs> so if I click unload, it will disappear from this list because it's no longer loaded in the DB. And if I come here and hit apply, you can see it's now unloaded. So what are the key elements to this? First, the data list selects from all the individual catalog tables. This is a snippet of the SQL use. You can see the data list uh, catalog, feature group catalog, and so on. The view XML and the unload spec actions require a catalog item type enumeration found in blackbaud.appfx.xmltypes.catalog item type. This list here shows that there are 46 spec types. Lastly, my unload spec um, record up calls the BlackBaud CLR stored procedure USP underscore unload spec. This spec is called by the unload spec method in the spec loader class contained in the BlackBaud app effects spec helpers assembly, which is called by load spec.dxc, which you likely use within Visual Studio to load and load specs. This is the unload spec record up. And of course, the key part of here is the calling of USP unload spec. The comments explain the params that are being used by the SPROC. Spec type is from the enum we saw in the previous slide, and spec ID is the ID of the spec from the catalog table, which contains the spec. Both of these are columns in my data list and are passed to the SPROC through a pipe-separated compound key. Lastly, note that the uh, USP underscore unlock spec requires the call to be wrapped in a transaction. Some things to note on this. Some specs like batch extensions take too long to unload and they time out. Um, I chose not to increase the timeout since these can take hours. Instead, I created global changes specifically for the types of batch extensions that I want to unload. Next, uh, the SPROC does not currently support unloading query view extension specs. And these are the spec types that I have not implemented. And lastly, the system privilege uh, spec type does not store the XML in the spec in the catalog table. So the view XML action is disabled for that. Now I'll hand it over to Dan. Uh, thanks, Kerry. Um, I'm Dan Napolitano. I've been with uh, Providence St. Joseph Health Foundation for roughly two years, um, 10 years in the nonprofit sector and 10 years in the private doing random types of system jobs. What I'll be talking about today are uh, some, some uh, really practical, actual practical uh, enhancements. So these are kind of using some of the more minimal functionality within the SDK, um, largely relying on specs and on uh, SQL, and not so much within the uh, UI models. So uh, even though some of this may look basic for some of the people uh, watching this, I hope that it gives you some ideas. 
Uh, the first problem I'll be talking about uh, comes about with the uh, conversions that we did. As David mentioned at the start of this presentation, we converted uh, roughly uh, 30 databases onto CRM. Um, during that time, we brought on a whole host of foundations, uh, all of which were all coming from an existing database for which they already had existing queries, reports, um, and other information that was readily available to them. When they came on to CRM, they had to learn this brand new system and also start to recreate those uh, reports again. Some of, a lot of their reports we did not convert for them. Uh, and we did set up some ad hoc queries for people joining uh, CRM, but they were still this, this lack of data uh, problem. So we needed to find a way to make data easy uh, to make the access to data easy but flexible. Um, we also didn't want to recreate the I, this thought of uh, list-based exports serving as reports. Uh, we really thought of these as more operational in nature. They were kind of generated for a one-time purpose and discarded. And what we wanted to do is really keep the user within CRM and not have to generate say, a PDF file or an Excel that they're working from Let's give them a list directly in CRM. And CRM already comes with precedence for that with list builders and data lists. Um, the thing we were seeing with CRM though is that those data lists and list builders were largely context-based and we needed to find a way to get um, these users that are new to CRM, not necessarily familiar with ad hoc query or even the system, easy access to data that's non-context in nature. We also had to deliver it quickly uh, despite the fact that our users were new. So that's difficult because a lot of times you need to get feedback from your users as to how they want to use things. If we're going to change uh, an existing page or introduce functionality, you typically want to have design sessions with them to solicit their feedback. However, new users, in my experience, aren't really up to speed enough to give that valuable feedback. They need to use the system for a while, and the best that they can really offer is the information or their experience from their prior system. And we didn't want to redesign CRM to be like their prior system. We wanted to, to design it for the strengths that the CRM was offering. So even though we wanted to deliver quickly, uh, we also needed to keep in mind that CRM was going to grow. We were going to further uh, customize it. So whatever we introduced, we did want it to serve as some type of um, design that can be used in the future. The solution that we came up for with uh, for giving people access to data in an easy fashion is what we call the foundation hub. And so I was mentioning that this is relatively simple functionality. It's really reliant on list builders. It's just a series of list builders. And we went with list builders because even though um, our foundations all had similar data needs, for example, everyone needs access to a list of their assigned prospects. Uh, or the assigned prospects for all the found, uh, fundraisers at their foundation. They might want to see all the plans at their foundation. However, they all wanted to see things differently. Some of them want to see, say, certain columns that other ones do not. The column order might change, so might sort and the filters. So what we really needed to do is find something that was flexible, but kept the data somewhat consistent. And really, list builders provide that uh, uh, functionality. We also wanted to uh, leave room for uh, future types of BI and reporting. So we didn't want to just say, hey, the hub's only for list builders. We did want, we our intent in the future is to introduce Power BI views and even possibly reporting. Uh, when we introduced this foundation hub, our concern was that the users that didn't have a list in there to immediately use would grow um, kind of accustomed to this functional area, foundation hub, and uh, understand that there's nothing there that really helps them, so they kind of ignore it over time. So we really didn't want that to happen. We wanted to introduce lists that not necessarily were hitting on the most pressing data needs when we first implemented, but that span the greatest amount of business units. Uh, so we went with things like funds, events, interactions, communications, assigned prospects and plans. You'll notice here is that revenue and donors is not included, and that is because we determined that those types of views really did require us to have uh, conversations with our various foundations to, to really settle on our shared terminology in advance before we went down the path of, of especially donor giving. 
we did implement it as a new functional area. This was to help uh, keep this cluttered feel that you, new users might have of a new system that has various functional areas already with multiple links. Uh, we didn't want to introduce additional links into those functional areas that they would then have to learn what those did. By creating a, a new functional area, we could just say, hey, go to the hub, find your data there. And then also it allowed us to really kind of be more creative in our approach versus working with an existing functionality that may or may not change after design sessions. The way that the functional area was implemented, I'll show in a sec. It was, it was implemented uh, as any functional area is, but the default task for that functional area, which is the task that fires when you click on the name of, say, Foundation Hub within the functional area ribbon, that default task is a show page action. So effectively, what that causes it to do is to uh, launch a page when you click on the functional area, and that page is what people believe uh, think of as the Foundation Hub. Our intent over time is to look at the other functional areas and do the same redesign. I'll cover that in a second. So this is just what the Foundation Hub looks like. You can see up in the top left-hand corner of, the, of that ribbon, the PSJH Foundation Hub. Uh, one of the benefits that comes along with using a page spec for a functional area, you see this already within the prospects functional area out of the box with CRM. Uh, the page spec allows you to make use of that left-hand side. So we've moved those common searches and other functional areas will move actions over there. Uh, Carrie already mentioned the fact that we try to embed within our pages uh, links to our knowledge base. Here we can make use of a direct link to our full knowledge base within the left-hand side. Uh, introduced on this page for the Foundation Hub is, it, in the summary view, is this global filter. Now, all of our foundations think of themselves within the system as sites. Each foundation typically is its own site. Uh, so users are really approaching the data in the system from a site view, not necessarily from the global uh, PSGH wide view. So this global filter, the, the way that this works is when they select from this global filter their sites, and you can see here that little hierarchy button there, which you seeing other features within Dream out of the box. Um, I introduced that here, and that's just making use out of the site hierarchy filter helper, which comes with CRM. Um, that, but anyway, selecting that site filter uh, will then cascade whatever selection you have down to the dependent sections, and that's uh, coordinated through the page spec. So if I select all sites within the global filter, all of my list builders below, all the sections below will be filtered by that site. And then that will stick that way. Here's just one example of, of one of the list builders. You can see uh, there's major giving, there's a prospects plan area, simple list builder, but we've embedded actions in there so people can actually do work from this area as opposed to having to drill into the record. And you can see again, we have links to the knowledge base below. Not all things have to be list builders. This is actually a data list, that, but it's shown within a repeater view. Uh, we did not end up introducing donors as a tab after performing some uh, design sessions with our foundation users. So this came after the first implementation. But you can see here, we've uh, developed a view data form. Uh, the data list only ever returns one record. And so the repeater view basically shows as if it's a page spec or as a, uh, as if it's just painted on the page. Things learned during this process, list builders, we went with list builders because of their flexibility. However, they tend to run slower in my experience than data lists. Um, I think that this is largely caused by the fact that it, with data lists, those are stored procedures and you can use temporary tables. Uh, within our list builders, we're using uh, table value functions and those rely on uh, table variables sometimes. List builders do appear to run the SQL twice, so what runs quicker when you're developing the SQL within, uh, say, your S uh, SSMS um, or whatever client you use to write your SQL, it might run faster, and it seems to take about roughly twice as long, um, in my experience. I, but still, what we can do with this is we really, I, when I develop these lists, uh, we, we still really try to uh, tune that performance down so people aren't waiting for things to run. The top level filter, when you set it, will clear out any dependent sections parameters that aren't linked directly. So it will pass the site down, but it will remove any parameters already set from other fields. The reception was, uh, the feedback has been positive. 
um, users appreciate the embedded actions in the lists, we do still get requests for new fields and also tabs. As I mentioned, coming out of this, our concern was that, hey, we just introduced this new functional area. What can we do to help simplify the rest of CRM? And so we started looking at other functional areas in the client and um, determined, hey, what can we do to actually use what we learned with the foundation hub and uh, use that same design within a different functional area? When we looked at the functional areas, the one that really stood out the most to us as the best starting point was administration. Uh, this would have the least impact to users when we did a redesign of it, uh, the least resistance from users because most people don't only go there for small things and those are typically the administration users. Um, so we didn't have to, again, we could react quickly in this case and not get involved in design sessions. Um, and then the other thing that we uh, that I noticed as I was going through the other functional areas is that each functional area typically in, included some level of configuration and reference update uh, task links. Um, and so with the redesign of the administration, our approach was to move all the configurations, all of the reference data updates into administration and remove those tasks from the other functional areas, which cleans up those functional areas, makes them easier to understand, gives people a one source location to go to to make their updates for configs or for reference data needs. And then it also, when we get to go to those functional areas at a later date to redesign those, there's less things to have to think about and figure out what to do with them. So a similar layout on our administration page, you can see we make use of that left-hand side for actions and searches. You can see that global filter at the top. Um, each of these tabs has a series of links. We still wanna feature data uh, as people approach these functional areas. That's one thing we wanna do is put data first and foremost at their fingertips as opposed to them having to click in to, to get to it. Um, and what we also look at is trying to push to the left the places that people more commonly need to go and push to the right the, the, the less um, active areas like configuration where you might only go once in a month or even once ever when you first set up CRM. Here in configuration, we have groupings, um, logical groupings in alphabetical order. Here's an example of we, we had to figure out, hey, how do we get something that is data oriented into administration? Nothing was really standing out. So we introduced new uh, quality audit functionality. This is also custom functionality, but I wanted to show it here just so you could see one of the ways that we have featuring data within administration. This is a list of all our, our flag conditions on data within the system where people can go and view and make edits. This is a summary page. This is an example of our details page where you can see another detailed view form. Uh, here they can check and recheck the conditions and go and drill into the, each condition to clean it up. So users have adopted administration. Having that uh, quality audit in there drove users into administration more so than they already would have been going there. And so that has um, given us some more feedback from users who are using it. We haven't gotten, um, to my knowledge, uh, complaints about the the changing of where the links are and, and you know now when people are in help desk and they want to know where to go to make a configuration change all we have to say is go to administration go to the configuration tab or if, if they want to know where reference data is go to uh, the reference data tab you can find it there a big problem with introducing a new functional area like this and doing a redesign is just consistency. Um, keeping consistent with the approach, especially with having all of our config, link, config links within administration, all of our reference data links in configuration um, or within uh, administration. So when we introduce new features to Dream, those typically come with tasks already and those tasks will put a config link on say the constituents or revenue functional area and we just have to be mindful hey we have this consistent approach let's remove that task link and update our administration page uh, that is it for me fantastic this is awesome awesome information guys um, and thankfully uh, the last thing i want to say is david carrie and dan thank you you guys did an awesome job this was really cool information